Hebrews in the New Testament. It's towards the end, latter half of the New Testament. Hebrews chapter 13. As you know, we are in the midst of a, a brief series called Real Godliness and Real Life. We normally as a church uh, pick a book of the Bible or a, a section of Scripture and just walk through it one, one section at a time, one paragraph at a time, one story at a time, so to speak. And and yet sometimes we'll have a, an occasion where pastorally we have a, a burden for a topic and we will look at, at that topic with different verses uh, in different parts of Scripture. That's what we're doing right now. We feel like the, the topic of godliness and specifically godliness in some of the, the nitty-gritty, the, the real aspects of life is, is crucially important for our church. Applying the gospel in the reality of life, not just in the kind of theoretical world, but in, in real life, in day-to-day -day life. Uh, that's what the Bible calls us to. So I'm going to read a, just a couple of verses this morning from the book of Hebrews. And let's remember as we read that this is God's holy, authoritative word. We bring our, our entire life to it, surrendered to his authority. Let's begin reading verse 5, Hebrews 13. Keep your life free from love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what can man do to me. May the Lord bless the preaching of his word. Over the years, there have been many stories, many versions of the story of the Holy Grail. Uh, if you have, for some reason, never seen one of those or read one of those stories, the, the Holy Grail is this mythological cup that is said to grant the person who has it eternal life. If you drink from the cup, you live forever. That's the idea. And so knights in the Middle Ages are said to have searched for it and so forth. Well, in one version of the Holy Grail story, the searcher has actually found uh, this cup. They've, they've found it, but then right at the moment of taking possession, uh, there is an earthquake and a chasm opens and... The one who's been seeking this cup is, is reaching for it. it it's, it's right there. It's about to plunge down into the abyss. It's there on the ledge, and he's, he's reaching down to get the cup, the, the object of his search. But the more he reaches for it, the closer he gets to death. And we see it from the perspective of, of knowing that the, the very promise of life, in his case, is, is, is going to produce death. And yet, at the final moment, a, a word of warning comes to him. Turn back. Turn back. And, and he does. He, he turns away from that treasure and is rescued. I, I think the writer of Hebrews would find that an apt description of how the Christian should think about the love of money, of possessions. We're going to talk this morning about contentment. Contentment is the topic of godliness we want to address. And I think this, this writer of Hebrews, he is coming to us as, as it were, as a voice on a cliff, aware that in every heart, Christian, non-Christian, there is this love of money. It's like a, a treasure that's, it's just there out of reach. And what it can purchase is always just there out of reach. And if I can just reach for it, it's just inches away. And he says, be free from the love of money. Keep your life free from the love of money. Be content, he says, with what you have. He doesn't just say it as a, a standalone command. He gives a reason for it. He pictures, as it were, if I can keep the metaphor going, look, God is right here with you. Don't reach for that treasure. You already have what you could long for. 
God is, is right here, as it were, on the edge of this cliff. And, and, and he's there calling to you, come to me. I am here with you. Keep your life free, he says, for the love of money. Why? Because God is with you. You don't need that to protect you in the future. The Lord is with you. I think for us, it, it is important that we see the, the kind of call of this on our lives as well. The love of money has no place in a heart that is trusting the Lord. The love of money has no place in a heart that is trusting the Lord. If you and I, if we claim to be those who trust the sovereign Lord then there is no room in that heart for the love of money. Or we could say it a different way. Contentment reveals our true confidence in Christ. Contentment reveals the state of our contentment is a window into the state of our true confidence in Christ. It struck me this morning as we were singing that so many of the topics in this series are related to the ancient heresy of Gnosticism. If you don't know what that, that uh, heresy is, uh, basically the idea was that the, the, the soul of a person, the mind of a person, so to speak, and, and the body of the person are, are separate, that there's this, this separation that can be made, that what matters is the, the spiritual things. And yet, uh, that's partially true, but partially devastating. <laughs> Because it's exactly in the physical world that the reality of our soul is revealed. We are one person. God made us body and soul. You could think, if you're a modern-day evangelical Christian, look, it doesn't really matter too much what my body does or what my pocketbook does or what my credit card statement says. What matters is in my heart, I love Jesus. The Bible would say, nonsense. Nonsense. Where your money goes, your heart goes. So where you budget, that reveals what you trust. So money is this window. If I can say it this way, money is the cliff test of the soul. Money is the cliff test of the soul. It's that moment on a cliff where you can either trust the Lord who is there holding you or you can reach for the treasure. It's the cliff test of the soul. Contentment reveals our true confidence in Christ. The love of money has no place in a heart that is trusting the Lord. Let's look and walk through this passage. I can break it up, I think you would too, into three major sections, all right? There's the command to keep your life free and be content. And then there's the reason, notice that word for, very important, for he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And then there is the result. So we can confidently say the Lord is my helper. It's important that, that messages that are, that are biblical kind of break down in terms of what the passage does. So that's, that's all we're doing. There's the command, you notice, and then there's the reason for that command, and then there's the result in verse 6. So we can say what happens then. So let's look at this one at a time. First of all, the command. Keep your life free from the love of money. Keep your life free. To be free from something means that it has no claim on you. It has no power over you. You haven't chained your heart, we could say it a different way, to the rise and the fall of our finances. We, we haven't imprisoned ourselves to the measure of our wealth. That's what he's saying. Keep your life free. And, and the command to keep your life free means this isn't merely a temporary season. It's not just something we do when we lose our job or, or say when you're facing a, a financial hardship. We'll be free from the love of money then. No, no this is to be a lifestyle yes. of the Christian. The Christian is, is, as a manner of life, free from the love of money. We're called to freedom from the love of money. It, it's a permanent mark of the godly Christian. It's part of what it means to be righteous, is to be free from the love of money. Now, now, an important caveat. Notice the verse doesn't say, if you look down in your Bibles, it doesn't say, keep your life free from money. This isn't exalting poverty as though poverty is in itself godliness. That was the mistake that a lot of the monks and so forth made in the Middle Ages. Poverty is godliness in and of itself. Well, no, it's not money per se. It's the love of money. Keep your life free from the love of money. It's a, it's a heart disposition that we're to be free from. 
The love of money should have no claim on the heart of the Christian. So let's, let's, let's ask some, some freedom tests, because I think money is one of the most deceptive areas for the Christian life. It is deceptive. I think that's why there are so many warnings about money, because it is deceptive. It's easy to look at your current life and say, well, I have these things and I make this money, but I don't love it too much. I don't love it. It's just one of the more deceptive areas of life. I think. I think that's why Jesus speaks to money over and over and over again, because we, we we're prone to self-flattery when it comes to materialism or the love of money. We're prone to think, well, I'm not. I, I am. I mean, you can always find somebody wealthier than you, and even if they are just as wealthy, people spend money differently. So you can look at some aspect of their life and say, well, I, I would never buy clothes that cost that much. Now, a car, maybe I would, but not clothes. I, I mean, that clothes are outrageous, what they spend on clothing. Let's go out to eat. I mean, you, you, there, there's, there's so many different ways you can compare, and it works out so that it's favorable. Isn't that the case? I would never buy a house that big. I love my yearly vacation. We, we do that kind of thing. And so you can flatter yourself. So we need some freedom tests. Freedom tests. Let me give you three questions. How do you know if your heart is free from the love of money? What happens when you get it unexpectedly? What happens to your heart when you get it unexpectedly? Do you find yourself significantly more joyful, peaceful, less anxious than you were the day before? Boy, the tax return was better than I thought it would be. D does that do something significant in your heart? What happens when you get it unexpectedly? What happens when you lose it or you face the threat of losing it? What happens to your heart right then? This is the real freedom test. The real freedom test comes when you get it or when you lose it. How do you know if your life's free from, from the love of money? Well, ask yourself the question, what happens to my heart when I get it? Does it leap or when I lose it, does it plunge? Well, here's an almost foolproof test. How generous are you? Someone who loves money does not love giving money away. Not sacrificially, not really. What happens to my heart when money increases? What happens to my heart when money decreases? A, a recent area where I, I realized the love of money in my heart. I had a, a moment, I think it was over the course of a, a couple of weeks, where I found out some, a, a really terrible report about my car. and needed all this work, apparently, this person said. And then we noticed all of a sudden the house seemed awfully hot. And so we, we went out, and sure enough, there, there was no cooling happening. And so we, we thought, oh, this is okay, because I am, I am maybe the least handy person in the church, uh, possibly. So I have a, a warranty on some of these things, because I'd rather pay, you know, so much a month for somebody else to come and help me fix this than not pay and have me break it trying to fix it. So I, I have this warranty. And, and I called the guy. I thought, no big deal. Not just paying for the, the you know, the charge for him to come out and let me know it's going to cost this much, but the company has it covered. Well, except that he said, well, what's broken on your air conditioning isn't covered under the warranty you've been paying for. I thought, well, why have I been paying all this money then? This is supposed to be peace of mind. This is supposed to be security. This is supposed to be safety. This, is, this represents well-being. He said, well, no, and actually it's going to be really expensive, and actually your air conditioning is really old. I don't even know if you should spend this much. I think you should buy a new one. And I thought, well, I wasn't planning on a new one. And I definitely wasn't planning on a new one and also having to do lots of stuff in my car. All of a sudden, I had some decisions to make. And what I realized was I was angry that day. There was an edginess. Um, you, know, you know what I mean, an edginess? There's like an edginess of your heart all of a sudden. All of a sudden, they got the news, this doesn't pay for it. You can't have this fixed, and also your car needs work. There, there's an edginess, there's an uncertainty. All of a sudden, my mind starts going, well, where, where are we going to get that from? How, how, what does that mean for this situation? How, how can I, what, is, what does this mean? What does this mean about the future? You know what that reveals? The love of money. I had been loving the money I thought I had. And when it suddenly became evident that I was maybe not going to have that money anymore, all of a sudden it was revealed I had been loving that money 
because losing it, I did not love. The writer of Hebrews is saying, keep your life free from the love of money. Okay, we want to obey. We want to be godly. I don't want to love money. How do I know if I'm doing that? How do you feel when you get it or when you lose it? And how easy is it for you to give it away? If it's marvelous to get it, if it's painful to lose it, if it's difficult to give it away, it's probable that your heart, like mine, has some chains, some money chains. It's not wrong to have money. It's not wrong to buy things. It's wrong to love them. Charles Spurgeon said, speaking of generosity, that our gifts are not to be measured by the amount we contribute, but by the surplus kept in our own hand. Our gifts are not to be measured by the amount we contribute, but by the surplus left in our own hand. What's he getting to? He's saying, look, it's possible to, to give in such a way that it doesn't touch your love of money. Do you give in such a way that it reveals that you don't love money? Well, that's a better test about whether the love of money is still present in our life. Then he, he moves to the positive side of this command. If you look down at your Bibles, he doesn't just say keep your life free from the love of money. He explains what this then means. Be content, he says, with what you have. Do you see that there? Be content. Keep your life free from this love and be content with what you have. So this kind of hedges in the person that says, look, I, I, I don't love money. Well, he says, prove it. Are you content with what you have? Or do you long for more or bigger or better? Are you content with what you have? Now, again, a quick caveat so we feel the real force of this. The Bible, obviously, is not against seeing good things that are present in the creation or the creation of man. The Bible is not against seeing and even desiring the value of new possessions that the Lord gives us the opportunity to purchase. It's not as though if you have a reason to buy a new car, he's against all the buying of any different thing than you have right now. Clearly, that is not the case. It's also not wrong to receive the Lord's provision for a newer possession or a bigger house. But it is wrong. It is wrong if you look at your current possessions and you feel your heart ache for something bigger and better. Look, if buying something bigger is a good moment of stewardship, it will allow you to serve the Lord in some greater way, to serve your family in some greater way, and you can honestly and genuinely say that this is, this is a good use of this money that I've been entrusted with. Okay, I don't think that's sinful. What's sinful is the ache of the heart towards what you have right now. The ache of the heart. How do we distinguish between legitimate purchases, legitimate buying and selling, which is positive in the Bible, and discontentment, which we are commanded not to have. Here's some questions. How deeply and how often do we think of newer or better things? How deeply and how often do you think of newer or better things? You know what I've caught myself doing? I've caught myself driving down the road and seeing a car, and a question will flash through my mind. Would I rather have that one than the one I have right now? If you've seen my car, you know, usually the answer is yes. <laughs> you know what that is? That, that, that's, that's like fertile ground for discontentment. Comparison is like the front door of a grumbling soul. Comparison, it's like the front door of a grumbling soul. You like to just walk in, oh man, look at this. This is nicer. Have you ever had the experience where you, you had to rent a car? You ever had that? Usually rental cars are usually a little bit nicer. And, and, and you get in and you think, oh, now this. This is nicer. It's shinier. They have like glowing lights and cool gadgets and video screens when you back up. Boy, that is cooler. Comparison, it, it, it's, it's this front door. You, you sort of walk into it and then you sit in this living room of grumbling 
It's not wrong if, we, if the Lord has provided for a, a certain new provision. But, but often I think it's the case that we deceive ourselves when the reality is our heart is discontent. How deeply and how often do we think about newer or better things? And the comparison, how frequently and passionately do you express gratefulness for the things that you have? C- compare those two. Do I think and speak more often about new or better things or more than I do gratefulness for the things that I have? Isn't it amazing how quickly even wonderful new things that we are given become commonplace to us? What is that? That's the motive of discontentment. It's shiny for two weeks. It's boring in the third. The scriptures say this is ungodliness. It is discontentment. Keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. Contentment believes that what we have is enough. It is enough. God may allow us to have more, but it's not what our heart longs for. It's not what we think about. It's not what we meditate, daydream about. If you could catch me in a daydreaming moment, would you catch me thinking about the new thing or expressing gratefulness for the thing I have? That's the question of contentment. Actually, this is, is present throughout the scriptures. I, I think uh, money and possessions are a often ignored, overwhelming topic in the scriptures. So lots of topics are ignored, but they're relatively small. Money and possessions is a massive topic in the New Testament that is infrequently studied. Let me encourage you to do that. Study money and possessions and giving in the New Testament. If you've never done that, t- take, take a few months. Uh, make it part of your personal devotions. It would be a great study. It's good for the soul because hidden idols keep us from growing in the Lord Jesus, except we don't know that they're doing it. So we're frustrated because we find our faith uh, lacking. Or we find our, our gratefulness waning and we find our soul edgy and we work on those other things. Why am I so impatient when the children break things? Why, 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 why am I worried about work? Why do I struggle with my boss? But we never look at the root of the issue, which may indeed be a wrong view of possessions and money. Right. I would encourage you to make, make, to make a decision some point this year, next year. Make a couple of months study of all the passages that address money, giving, and possessions in the New Testament. Your soul is intended by the Lord to be free from the burden of these idolatrous chains. God looks at people and says, oh, they're all chained up. Let's be free from that. It's a false promise. It's a grail that promises life and produces death. Listen, for example, to Paul speaking to Timothy about false teachers that were greedy for money. He says this, food with food and clothing, with these we shall be content. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we cannot take anything out of the world. If we have food and clothing, with these we shall be content. For those who desire to be rich fall into a temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that, listen, plunge people into ruin and destruction. Here it is. For the love of money is a root of of all kinds of evils. Sometimes we want to address the evils, but we don't want to chop out the root. The love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. And listen, it is through this craving, listen to this, that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. He pictures almost like a person on a safe and true path that instead of staying on that path, wanders in search of some treasure and is ensnared and impaled by some device or or trap or snare. He's saying, look, this is the love of money. It even causes professing Christians to wander from the faith. Money is a reason people don't follow God. It cannot be more serious than that. It's a reason professing Christians wander away from the faith. Listen to Jesus speaking in Luke 16. No servant can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot, cannot serve God and money. 
And it continues, the Pharisees, listen to this phrase, who were lovers of money, heard all these things, and they ridiculed him. And he said to them, you are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts. For what is exalted among men is an abomination in the sight of God. Boy, could we, could we apply that to our own hearts? Isn't it easy to justify yourself in terms of loving money and contentment? Man, that is easy to do. Again, like I said, you can always find somebody that looks richer than me, right, that buys nicer things or has nicer... Well, they, they, they love money, but I'm good. I'm, I'm, I'm more on the poor side of well-off, right? We, we, we can tend to think about ourselves that way. Or we might go all the way back to the Old Testament and the last of the Ten Commandments, the final piece of the Ten Commandments, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey, or we might apply his accord or his SUV or his pool or his vacation or anything that is your neighbor's. When God compiled 10 words to summarize what it meant to love God and love your neighbor, covetousness, or the opposite of contentment, was one of those things. Don't do it, God says. Not because God is miserly and tyrannical, because he looks at hearts chained by comparison and craving possessions. John Piper says, the person who thinks the money he makes is meant mainly to increase his comforts on earth, is a fool, Jesus says. Wise people know that all their money belongs to God and should be used to show, to show, this is why we have money. This is why we have money. This is the reason there's money in any bank account. It's to show that God and not money is their treasure. So we're given money, Piper says, to show that this money is not our treasure. In other words, money, every dollar is a test. To show that God and not money is their treasure, their comfort, their joy, and their security. Let us ask ourselves this honest question. Are our hearts free from the love of money and from the craving for more or better possessions? But here's the good news. The Lord does not simply issue this command. Isn't that so kind of him? He doesn't just, he could just issue the command. Don't do it. I'm God. It all belongs to me. Don't do it. Don't do it. At full stop. Do not do it. Do not love money. Do not crave what you don't have. Be content. Don't do it. He could just stop there. But no. He gives the reason why the love of money is unnecessary. He says, don't do it, but the reason why you don't need to is it's unnecessary to do. You, you don't need to be chained to money. You don't need to crave money. You don't want to love possessions. Why? Why? Well, that's the reason. Point number two. The, the, the reason why we can be free from the love of money and should be is that he says, he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. And if you have like I do in your Bible, if you look down there, you probably see in your Bible a, a, a little notation there that says where that reference comes from. Do you see that in your Bible? It, some Bibles might have that. That comes from the book of Joshua. That's where that quote's from. It's God speaking to Joshua, and he's saying to Joshua, when he's about to cross into the promised land, I will never leave you or forsake you. And so it makes the quote more profound. Why? Because God's people are headed to a promised land. God's people are headed to a land that will not rust, that will not decay. And as they were headed into that land, God said to them, look, as you head towards that land, I will never leave you or forsake you. So why should we be free from the love of money? Because we are going to the promised land. And by faith in Christ, our possessions are already there in that land. And so the Lord comes to Joshua and he comes to every believer and he says, Look, I will never leave you or forsake you. 
Look, this is the good news of the gospel. The writer of Hebrews has been laboring to make this point over and over throughout the book. Look, don't go back into the wilderness of the pre-Christ situation. Live your life in light of what Christ has done, and that includes the freedom from money or the things money can buy. What possession do we have because of Christ? We have the possession of a God who is right next to us, who never leaves us and never forsakes us, who is intent on our good, who is caring for us, who is loving us. Why are we able to have this? Well, because every covetous thought, just, just try to imagine, just think right now for a moment, just list them out in your mind. How many covetous thoughts do you think you've had this week? Hundreds? How many times have you grumbled about some possession? Huh. How many times has your heart risen with an increase in finances, dropped with a decrease in finances? How generous are we? What do you do with all that record? Those sins of discontentment, of covetousness, of craving, of, of kind of money ambition. What do, you, what do you do with all those sins? In God's terminology, they are idolatry. That They are saying that money will protect us. Money will keep us safe. Money and what it buys will bring us joy. God looks at the heart that craves money and what it buys, and he says, it's a false god. And you're worshiping that false god just as surely as the Israelites worshiped the calf in the wilderness. So, so what do we do with all of those sins? Well, if we listen to the writer of Hebrews, we are reminded that there is one who paid the price for covetous idolaters. That there is a, a, a man who hung on that cross. And what was happening on that cross? God was punishing him for greedy hearts. That's what was happening on the cross. God was looking at Jesus as though he was a grumbling, comparing, greedy man. A, a man who was tied up in the love for money, who clutched possessions but didn't cling to God. He was looking at Jesus that way, who is ambitious for wealth. He was looking at Jesus and saying, you are a greedy, covetous, comparing man. You grumble about the gifts I've given. You crave what you do not have, and I will lay on you my full judgment for trading gold for God. That's what was happening on the cross, just in the category of greed. That, that's why Jesus cried out from the cross, why have you forsaken me? Because greedy, covetous sinners had forsaken God and reached for gold. And so God was treating Jesus as the sinner that had forsaken God in search of gold. He was treating him that way, saying, you, you will have what your heart desires. I will withdraw myself from you because these sinners have rather have gold and possessions than have me. That's what God was treating. He was giving Jesus what sinners actually crave, the, the wrath of God for rejecting him and choosing possessions. He was giving Jesus the punishment for that choice. So when Jesus died on the cross and he said it is finished, he took into the grave our punishment for our greed, for my grumbling, for my angry heart about an air conditioning that's broken. He, he, he took that on himself and he took it into the grave so that I bear it no more. And the thousands of complaining moments and eye rolls about things that break and a, a lower income that I want and, and a house that has cracks in the walls. I, I, I take all of those complaints and I, I put them on Jesus and he bears them. And so now, do you know what God says to me? He says, I will never leave you or forsake you for the high priest has sat down in the throne room of God and you can now enter by faith into my presence and your greed and your discontentment. It has no bearing on my closeness to you. I approach you as I approach Jesus, the one who gladly gave up the wealth of heaven to embrace the dirt of earth, the king who embraced the stable, the master who walked dusty roads with tired feet. That contentment 
I give that record to you. And in light of who Jesus was, I will never leave you or forsake you. You know that experience you have? It is it, it's rare because our children are, are miniaturized versions of us. When, when your child unexpectedly expresses gratefulness and contentment, you know that experience? You, you know, it, it's, like, it's like a breath of mountain air in the midst of like an L.A. morning. I mean, it's, you, you, you feel this, this moment. All of a sudden, you're like, what was that? Thank you, Mommy, for all that you did to make this lunch for us. And you just think, what is happening right now? You know, that's how Jesus was all the time. And you know, that's the reputation that covers us before God. And that same fatherly, motherly disposition of affection that rises in the heart at that moment, that's how God relates to us. And so he says to us, I will never leave you or forsake you. Stop reaching for that golden false promise. I will never leave you or forsake you. Why should we be free from the love of money? Why should we want to put the love of money to death? Because the degree to which we cling to money, our hands are closed to embrace the nearness of God. The, the degree to which we cling to possessions, our hands and our heart, it's closed to the closeness of God. That, that's the point Jesus is trying to make. You cannot serve two masters. You cannot have the money half of your heart and the God half of your heart. Both demand it all. So let go of the love of money and cling to the love of your life. God, who loves you and will never leave you and will never forsake you. Now, trust me, I know this and you know this. Money forsakes you. You have it, then you don't have it. You had a job, and then you lose a job. You had a nice possession, and then it broke. You bought this car, and then it seemed like it was fine, and then it crashed. It forsakes you. It's like it runs away. Have you ever had experience? You look back at the last few months, you think, where did it go? Doesn't it forsake you? I mean, it forsakes you so quickly. God never forsakes you. You never have a day where your account with God is so low you can be overdrawn. You never have to check your balance with God. You never have to wonder if God will still work through next year and through next summer. See how much better God is? God is not a harsh taskmaster. He, he tells us to come away from things that we think we need that are actually burdensome and to embrace the things we truly need that are found in him. I will never leave you, he says. I, I, who's he talking about? God, the God that owns everything. Imagine the child. He says, I got to hold on to this trinket. I got it in the thing of the store. And the claw went down and picked it up. It's a perfect diamond ring, daddy. Look at this. And the owner of the real diamond mine says, I am right here. Let it go. Never leave you. I, I, I will never forsake you. Why should you be free from the love of money? Because you have God. Now, should you make money as a servant of the Lord? Might some of us be called to make a lot of money? Sure. Might some of us be called to have nicer houses, less nice houses, a way of serving? Sure. I, it's not about a, 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 a standard of possession. It, it's about a condition of the heart. And don't let your conscience be relieved by that. Ask yourself the question, do I love my possessions more than I love my God? He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. That's the reason. And then <laughs> he keeps going and brings us to a result. Look at verse 6. He brings us to a result. So what's the result of all this? What's the result? We can confidently say, I love that word, we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper, I will not fear, what can man do to me? The result is not to bring us into sort of this, this state of, of kind of passivity towards the future. Well, I don't know what the future holds. God knows all that. I'm not sure. No, no. We're supposed to have this active, almost aggressive, almost challenging question that we shout to our own heart as we think about the future. The Lord is my helper. Who's your helper? God. God helps me. 
God sustains me. God lifts me up. God keeps me right where he wants me. God provides for all that I need. God ensures that I have all that I need to serve him. God does all of those things. I won't lose a thing that I need to serve God because who's my helper? God is my helper. Therefore, what? I will not be afraid. Listen, fear and anxiety are one of those evils that can trace themselves often back to the root of the love of money. Not all anxiety, but a lot of anxiety can trace itself back to a root of trusting something rather than God. Fear and craving are just the reverse side of the same coin. If you fear something, it's because you crave the opposite of it. We fear losing something that we crave having. So if we give up the love of money, the love of possessions, we can face the future without the chains of that love chaining us to fear. Let me me ask you a question. Let's imagine that tomorrow you lose your job. Tomorrow you lose your job. A few months later, you lose your house. Are you afraid of that happening? I would be, because I think the love of money is still there in my heart. I would be. But you know what I know theologically? Really, I know this. Look, the Lord would provide. I don't know how he would provide. Maybe he'd provide a different job. Maybe he'd provide the the generosity of people sacrificing. And, And might it hurt my reputation? Well, sure it would. But I'm not clinging to my reputation either. What if, what if next year, you, you, for whatever reason, the finances change, and, and you have to have one car instead of two? Are you afraid of that? Are you afraid of what that would mean? Well, how can I do what I'm supposed to do with one car? That's impossible. Are you afraid of that? Are, are you afraid of your air conditioning breaking some point this summer, and there, there's just not cash to, to throw at that right now? Are you afraid of not having enough when you reach old age? Is, is it frequently a fear that's on your mind? Are you afraid of not having enough flexibility in your lifestyle? I want to be able to do things. I need having enough money so I can do those things. I, I was looking at a website this week of a, some kind of a financial advisor, and he had a blog post that said, Money is freedom. You know what God says? The love of money is slavery. Freedom is found in me. If you want to look at the future without fear, give up the love of money. That's what the writer of Hebrews is saying. Be free. Be free. Be free from the love of money. I don't know what the future holds. I don't know what my AC is going to do. I don't know how I'm going to pay and help the kids if they want to go to college. I don't know what the future... It doesn't mean you don't work hard and plan and strategize. I'm not saying planning is bad or investments are bad. I'm saying that we can do that with a heart that ultimately trusts God and not those things. So we plan and release it to the Lord. We work and release it to the Lord. We budget and release it to the Lord. We steward and release it to the Lord. Ultimately, our heart says... The Lord is my helper. Therefore, what? I will not fear. What can man do to me? The answer is nothing. Nothing that isn't God's good purpose for me anyway. Nothing. Listen, financial fear, it ruins marriages. It takes people away from healthy local churches because they're desperate to make more money somehow. You understand all the caveats in the world, not good decisions, not wise. God's calling me to this situation. I'm talking about the idol now. It takes people away from their families because they're, they're so desperate to protect themselves from the future that they're not willing to entrust that future to the Lord. Look, the love of money, it's the root of all kinds of evil. Brothers and sisters, Keep your life free from the love of money. If you want the easiest way I know to start this process, focus on generosity 
It's the easiest way. Look, generosity is like bleach to the weed of the love of money. You pour some generosity on that weed, it will wither. You can't love what you give up. And the good news is, the more we give up the love of money, the more we are forced, we are forced to replace that trust in our heart with fresh fellowship with the Lord Jesus. Look, you can't have a bank account go down and go nowhere. You have to go somewhere. And so what the passage says is, you can go right to the Lord. You can go right to the Lord. Because he has said, because of the cross of Christ, I will never leave you or forsake you. And so we can say, I will not fear. What can man do to me? Nothing. Nothing outside of the providence of my God. Look, we, we live life in this world surrounded by temptations and the sinful nature in our heart, it reaches for them. And in the kindness of God, he stands next to us by his spirit with the promises of the gospel. And he says, I am with you. Let it go. Let it go. Be content with what you have. Cling to me. I am all you need. Let me encourage you to do something in response to this message. Uh, two halves of a thing. First of all, uh, don't be thinking about this in terms of other people. All right? <laughs> this passage is not written, help your brother be free from the love of money. So don't do that, all right? Don't, don't, don't start this place of saying, I know exactly how you can be free <laughs> from the love of money. I have a great ways. Don't, don't do that. Don't do that. We need to be ruthless with our own hearts, gracious, and quick to believe the best about others. Direct it to your own heart. Ask the question, how can I wither the love of money in my heart and replace it with trusting God. What are practical steps I can take this week to free myself from the love of money and to replace that love with trust in God? You think about that personally. If you're a father or husband, think about that for your family. How can I do that? I want my family, myself, to embrace God and not cling to the love of money. Think about some practical ways. Don't just hear this message and think, oh, that's really good. I shouldn't love money too much. No, no, let's make some practical changes. Practical changes this week. Practical changes that demonstrate I am forcing my heart to be free from the love of money and I am focusing my trust on the steadfast care of the Lord. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you did not have to offer yourself as a substitute for trusting money. You could have just commanded it Thank you that you are a better treasure than anything on earth. Thank you that you are a better protection than anything we have. Thank you that you are a greater joy than any joy that money can buy. Lord, give us you. Give us your presence. Give us your word. Give us your glory. Give us the taste of your goodness. And Lord, we ask as needy people that you would work to set us free from the love of money, that you would break any chains in our hearts that chains us to possessions and materialism and the idol of stuff and comparison and grumbling. Lord, set us free, Lord. Help us to entrust ourselves to you to make you our treasure, Lord. Make us a generous people, Lord. A generous and overwhelmingly generous people, Lord, that gladly display through our generosity that you are our treasure. Yes. 
and that nothing in the future tempts us or causes us to fear. Lord, we pray you would do that, Lord. Please do that among us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I'd like to ask you, um, two different categories of people, I'd like to ask you to pray uh, and to come up and, and receive prayer. Um, one is, if you are currently facing a decline or a risk in your finances, um, I, I, we'd like to pray for you. We'd like to pray that God would provide, that he would just provide miraculously even this week, that he would fix what's broken, that he would provide uh, what's needed in resources. And also, if you feel that as we've been looking at this passage, you feel like well, this is an area that I have not addressed. It's just been there in my heart. It's definitely there. I know that I do this. And it's, it's just got me. Would you come forward? And just acknowledge that and acknowledge that you need prayer for God to help you begin to make changes this week. So if you're facing financial need, if you're in a unique way aware of some financial cravings or idolatry there, just come forward. Let, let us pray for you. Let's take a moment and encounter the Lord. For the rest of you, have a grace-filled week. Youth and parents, remember the meeting this evening uh, with Bart, and we will see you at community group or next Sunday. God be with you.